This is episode number 21 with Ben Askren. How do you learn that? Well, you pick something you want to do and you try really hard at it and you fail some and you get back up and you fail some more and you do some problem solving. And so that's how you really learn something. If your parents make you do something, you don't really learn it. If you don't really care about something, you don't really learn it. The way you learn the most is when you're deeply passionate about something and there's nothing that matters more than you being successful at it. Welcome back to another episode of Anchors of Health, where it's all about helping you achieve the best health you possibly can. And I do that by bringing on world-class experts on the four key anchors of health, which is mindset, nutrition, movement, and recovery. Within each, it's all about finding what works for you. I'm your host, Bill Choi, and today's episode is all about mindset with one of the most accomplished U.S. wrestlers of all time. He's a multiple-time NCAA champion, 2008 Olympian, and he's arguably the best welterweight mixed martial artist of all time. And I brought him on to talk about mindset. How can we take the principles and concepts of someone who is world-class in what they do and apply it to our lives? That's what it's all about. It doesn't matter if you don't like MMA or wrestling or even sports for that matter. There's still a lot of key takeaways in this one. So in this episode, we talk about the three key things that help Ben become successful the importance of vision and how you can ignite that vision, the importance of struggling and failing, Ben's biggest failures and what he did to overcome them, what it takes to be great, what you and your kids can do to manage fear and anxiety leading up to a major event, how to be a better parent when it comes to your kid's athletic development, his take on specialization for kids, what Ben thinks about early competition for kids, the two books that Ben gifts the parents the most, and so much more. If you want the show notes and links to everything we discussed, just head over to Anchor's of health.com slash 21. So let's just jump right in. Here's my conversation with Ben Askren. Ben, welcome to the Anchors of Health podcast. Thank you for having me. So Ben, I'm obviously a huge fan of everything you've done in MMA and wrestling, but I brought you on to talk about mindset because you have a lot of insight in this very important area and there's a lot I want to cover, but let's start with this. When and how did you first become aware of mindset being so important? Well, I would say early on, and uh, you know, my dad used to say it, it's all mental when, when I, we were competing in sports when my brother and I were little kids. And you know, he, he never really expanded past that <laughs> besides saying it's all mental. So I guess I, I didn't realize what was important about it, but I realized there was something important about it. And so then that that's it for a while. And, you know, it wasn't until college till I started really uh, delving a lot deeper into uh, what the mental aspect of it had to do with success. There's many things that go into being successful, but if you had to boil it down to just three key things, what are the three key things that helped you become successful? Oh, yeah, uh, I, I guess I, I think you're correct in that saying that hey, it's impossible to boil, to boil down to just three. Oh, wow. If I had to do just three, um, I would say I, you know, hard work. I almost don't even want to cl- include that, like work ethic, because I, I think that should almost be a given. Obviously, you're gonna have to be hardworking if you want to be successful at someone. But still, like I don't know if I want to count that because that that again that should be a given. Number two would be uh, I don't know how you want to consider it, but problem solving, adaptability, evolution, you know, whatever you want to say, just the ability to think past whatever you're doing, see down the road, see what your roadblocks are, and, and make it happen. You know, in, in my sport of wrestling or mixed martial arts, that, that's something that's lost on a lot of people. They definitely get the number one hard work, but then when it comes to thinking about it, man, they really, really, really struggle with that one they rather just go keep working hard as opposed to fixing the problems and then if i had to say number three i would think it would be and again i hate that you're limiting to three but if you had number three be dealing with adversity because if you're going to be great at anything there's going to be um, a high level of adversity and many times and the ability to bounce back from it very quickly and work through it is going to be gigantic if you're if you're the kind of person who has some adversity and you crumble and you're weak in the face of it man you're not going to get very far in any endeavor Right, exactly. And and something I've heard you talk about and mention is the importance of vision. And, uh, you know, when I, when I did a lot of research on you, I felt like that was kind of like the starting point for people to find that vision. So what are some ways that we can foster that vision? Yeah. And, and you know, lots of times I, I reference it, you know, based on kids, because 
uh, I was able to find my vision in, in life really early. I, and I, you know, I would say a couple key trigger points where I went to watch the high school state tournament when I was in fifth grade. And, and I said, dang, I want to be a state champion. And then when I was 15, I got to go watch the Olympic trials in Dallas, Texas. And I said, I want to be an Olympian. And sure enough, eight years later, I made it to the Olympics. Um, but I can really point out those two key things as, as, you know, things that set my mind down the road to what I wanted to be a lot later in life. And so I was lucky enough to have those things happen early. And most, whether it's a coach or a parent or a mentor or whoever, they don't talk about that with kids. They kind of just talk about the here and the now. And I think that's a big mistake because the earlier you're able to set your vision on, on what you can be. And there's actually, there are scientific studies backing this up. This is just not my intuition. There are, there are studies that back this up. But the earlier you can set your mind on what you want to be later and see down the road, it drives success big time. And so the earlier you can create those visions for yourself, the easier and the more, the easier you're going to get there and the more successful you're going to be. That's amazing. So fifth grade was really the first time you saw that vision? Yeah, so the, so my first we so what we call them with our academy we call them ignition events. Um, somewhere you hopefully take a kid to kind of where he can see his future, uh, or you know, or, you know, motivate them to to see what their future is. Um, the first one for me would have been yeah, the high school state tournament. Uh, as a fifth grader, I went and watched it, and I, you know, in Wisconsin, it's it's sold out, and you know, every year since that, you know, every year that I've ever been, the finals are sold out, and that was. Shoot, what grade was that? 1995, maybe, 94, somewhere around there. Um, and so it's just this huge environment, 15,000 people, and they do this little parade. And it's just like, you know, as a fifth grader, that's very impressionable. You say, damn, I want to do that. And so, you know, that was my first real large ignition event where I said, that that's what I want to do right there. And, um, you know, then I said my second one was with the Olympic trials in 2000. I convinced my parents. I don't even know how I did this. Yeah, how did you do well, that? <laughs> I don't know. I just said, hey, I want, there was a camp, and then there, there was a camp going with the trials. And I said, hey, I want to go to this. And they're both working. So I convinced them to fly me down and get my own hotel room. Like, I don't know. I don't know how I talked them into that. That's insane. <laughs> but so nevertheless, I talked them into it to letting me go to that uh, when I was 15 all by myself. And I saw those guys, and I said, that's what I want to be. And I even said, I said in 2004 I'm going to qualify for the Olympic trials. In 2008 I'm going to make the Olympic team, and that was uh, that was what happened. Wow, unbelievable! And so you mentioned this ignition event that I think is a phenomenal thing that you guys are doing there at your academy, helping kids uh, to kind of see their future. And you know that's something that I guess adults can apply to their lives too, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I mean, anyone anyone can apply it to their life. I mean, if if you don't have someone who motivates you or someone you can look at and say, I want to be like that person or I want to do that thing, uh, I, you're not searching hard enough or you don't have a pulse. W one of the two. I mean, and even today, there's people I look at and, you know, I'm motivated by it. And it, it could be way bigger than me, right? Like with my wrestling academies, you know, I, I read the, the book Shoe Dog, the book Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. Mm -hmm. And it's like, damn, that's motivational to see how hard he had to work to make Nike go and then to see what Nike is today. You know, that it, it's super motivational because it's like they, that dude struggled for damn near 20 years to make that company work. And now they're one of the biggest in the world. And so, you know, when, when as an entrepreneur, when I'm having <laughs> struggles in year five and thinking, damn, I'm putting a lot of time into this. I'm not having success. I want to yet. Then you think, well, Phil Knight did it. He grinded it for 20 years before he really made it, if you will. And it kind of puts things in perspective. Absolutely. Now, how big should that initial vision be? Do you believe it should be something like way up there or something that, you know, is kind of in that mid-tier level? Like, like, how do you approach that? Uh, I mean, honestly, when I had them for myself, I didn't really think about it. I mean, you chose the Olympics. You can't get higher than that. Well, I mean, the first one, yeah, but I, yeah, like I said, I, I didn't think about it. I was just a kid and I wasn't saying, hmm, I'm going to set ignition events. It was like, I see it, I want to do it, you know? And that was, that was all it was. And so, um, but, you know, I, w I would say, why not aspire to the highest levels? There, there's really nothing wrong with that whatsoever. And, um, you know, that's obviously not saying you're going to have a whole bunch of short-term and mid-term goals to try to get there. But there's really nothing, I, in my opinion, there's nothing wrong with aspiring to be the top. And I don't really know it any other way. That's all I've ever done. Wanted to be the best. So, so what do you do to keep that vision front and center in your life? Do you write your goals down? Do you journal every day? Can you kind of walk us through what you do for that? Yeah, I, I actually don't. I talk about it. I speak about it. For example, you know, as an MMA, I said I want to be the best fighter in the world. 
um, when I was in college wrestling. So I don't want to be NCAA champ and Hodge champ or Hodge award winner. So yeah, I, I you know I definitely um, I spoke about them, but it, you know it's not something. Well, that's I guess even big. I, that's even bigger. Saying something it, publicly is, is sure. Is crazy. I guess that is bigger, right? So yeah, so I, I stated what my goals were. But then it's one of those where it's just, that's my goal. I don't need to think about that every day. I, I know that it's there. And so, you know, for me, I would say the mid and the short terms are more important. You know, we say growing my business, asking Wrestling Academy. It's like, I know I want to be the biggest and the best in the United States one day. And so then it's like, okay, well, what do I got to do today? What do I have to do this week? What do I have to do this month to start making those things happen? And, you know, some of it's as small as I need to go get another kid to sign up. Right. Or I need to make this kid a little bit better. or I need to make this kid enjoy it more. It, you know, it's, it's a lot of really small things. And so people, I don't want to say focus too much, but once you set your point, you know, your long term goal, then I think it's a whole lot more about short term and medium term goals to make yourself really successful. Absolutely. So let's get into some of that because, you know, I think next is persistence, right? It's that it's the hard work that you were talking about. That's super important. Um, most people drop out. And there's a lot of roadblocks under the umbrella of persistence. So let's start with toughness. Do you think like our society today is more soft or mentally weak than ever? Um, but I would say yes. I, I would never put it in those terms necessarily. And I, you know, so I, what I would say the problem is is people thinking they can have what they want too easily. And and frankly, if you look at modern society, you know, people kind of bash on modern society, but modern society, living in 2018 is better than living at any other time in the history of the world. Oh, there, absolutely. It, it, there is metrics to prove that from whether you want to go healthcare, uh, longevity, poverty, you, you name it, right? Living in 2018 is better. And we've, we've had significant advances in everything. And that's not saying that there's no work to be done as, as, uh, uh, mankind, but that that's, it's a great place to live. Now in America, um, one of the things that, that happens is, you know, especially in America is, is things are more accessible. You can get things easier than ever before and faster than ever before. And there is this level of instant gratification and, you know, and then you go to the helicopter parent who wants their kid to have the finest of everything. And, um, but where you really learn stuff and this is where, you know, parents are, sometimes they think they're helping, too much, you know. They think they're helping, but what they're really doing is hurting because they're they're not letting their child struggle and fail. And that's mm-hmm. where you really learn something. You learn something by struggling and by failing. And like you know, I said, if I pick top three adversities on there, well, you don't you don't learn how to deal with adversity unless you have adversity. It's impossible. Right. The only way to learn how to deal with this is to experience it. And so, you know, those parents who are protecting their kids from failure or protecting their kids from struggle are doing their kids a a gigantic disservice because if you want to be successful at anything you absolutely have to deal with adversity and deal with it well absolutely so i mean dealing with failure right so can you talk about the failures that you've had personally in your life and what you did to overcome them well i yeah absolutely you know i've pretty much failed at at all my big goals my goal four time state champion four time ncaa champion uh an olympic gold medalist those are my three biggest goals and man i i didn't succeed at any of them i i succeeded literally at, at zero of those and so it's like man that there's failures all the time but again that that's what builds you up and then obviously th- those are the big ones but then uh, you know i'm constantly setting goals uh, you know small and medium and all that and so um I don't, I don't know. I, I can't really give you, I guess, you know, if the obvious ones are my NCAA finals losses, something where I thought I was doing everything I could. And obviously I was not doing enough or, you know, maybe it just wasn't my time. And, you know, those things drove me. And then obviously the Olympic failure, you only get one shot. Really, you only get one shot at, at the at the Olympics because it's every four years. And I, I didn't have success at the Olympics. And you kind of talked about this earlier. Um, sacrifice. Do you feel like in order to achieve something great, there needs to be a certain level of sacrifice, and people are unwilling to go there? Yeah, I, I, I yeah, I, I think that I think that goes without saying. Because you know, if and, and this is what I would say to kids, if it was easy, everybody would do it. Mm-hmm. I mean, and and that you know, that's kind of a common saying, but that's the truth. It's like, okay, what's what's special about getting a Big Mac at McDonald's? There's nothing. Anyone who has a dollar can go freaking to McDonald's and get a Big Mac. What's special about that? Nothing. But when you talk about, we're talking about a state title, we're talking about a college scholarship, we're talking about an NCAA 
title. Those th- the reason those things are special, the, the reason those things carry lots of value is because of what it takes to get there. And you know what it takes to get there is gigantic amounts of sacrifice. There's going to be a lot of things that you give up and a lot of things you do that maybe aren't the easiest way to do them. But then as you do them, every, as you drive yourself to those big things, that's what really gives value to those achievements. Now, let's talk about fear and anxiety. When it comes to performing at a big event, like in your case, it's probably the most extreme and scariest of any sport in the world, which is MMA. You're fighting in front of a sold-out arena with media, cameras, and the world watching you. But for others, you know, maybe it's just speaking publicly, or maybe it's a fear of flying, whatever it is. In your case, what do you do to overcome fear and anxiety in those hours leading up to a major event? Yeah, um, I don't know. You know, I've got got pretty good. I guess I'll give you... A story to to, to to emphasize this, but when I was 15 years old, I went to uh, the national tournament and it, the, it was the biggest national tournament. It was it's kind of at that point it was the one. The but I lost my first two. I went 0 and 2. Lost my first two matches, and then that means you're out of the tournament. And one and I learned a valuable lesson. That was I was I was kind of obsessing about all the different things that could happen as opposed to just relaxing and focusing on, on what I can control. And one of my coaches who was a very good coach at the time said, you know, something like, Hey, I, I struggle with this also. And I, I think a lot of people who are, uh, I don't want to say high strungs, maybe not necessarily the word, but, um, people who are super analytical, think a lot about stuff. Mm-hmm. They struggle because, you know, if you really look at the big picture on certain things, like this one was a gigantic national tournament, you could, there's so many things to consider. Oh, what, what about the college coaches watching? What if I face this guy in round four? What if this guy loses to that guy? And so there, there's so many things that could happen. And so I caught myself focusing on uh, everything except what was important, and that's winning the matches. And so ever since then, I in really, especially in my fighting career, I will literally fly, fly people to my fights who know nothing about fighting but who are my friends and who I enjoy spending time with. And because I want to stay as relaxed as possible, I don't want to think about the fight when I'm in the locker room. I don't want to think about my wrestling match before 30 minutes before I'm wrestling. Because, listen, if, if I don't have the skills and I don't understand what strategy I need to take, I'm not going to fix it 30 minutes before. I'm not going to fix it an hour before. And so it's like those those things are those are things that have problems that need to be solved way, way, way ahead of time. And so in the, you know, in those final moments, the only thing I needed to be doing is getting myself as ready to compete as possible. And for me, that's being calm and being relaxed. And that's it. I mean, that, that's literally all I have to do. And then I will go out and execute the way I need to execute. And so that's kind of my thing is, you know, I don't feel nervous. I don't feel pressure. And I think a lot of that's because I've developed a really good process to getting myself ready to compete at, at the highest levels. Right. And I guess a lot of that confidence comes with all the preparation you did prior to the event. Now, something I've heard is how in training camp, it's like 90% physical and 10% mental. And then leading up to the event, it kind of switches where it's 10% physical and 90% mm. mental. Would you agree with that? I would say 10% mental in, in training is probably too low. Not that you could actually really put a percentage on it. But, you know, in, in in training camp, you should be constantly thinking about, you know, especially when you're younger, you know, because I think when you're younger, it's really uh, you, you're trying to build your skills. And so, you know, you should constantly be thinking about, well, what could I have done better? What do I need to do different? Why did he do this to me? Why did he do that to me? And, and just really deeply consider those things. And so that that's a that's a lot mental right there. Right. You're, you're, you're spending a lot of time thinking about. Um, how you need to execute better. And so, you know, like I was talking about those, those, those initial characteristics, say at adversity, say you go in one day and get your butt kicked and then you're depressed for the next two weeks because you don't understand how to deal with the, uh, adversity. Well, that's that's going to be a huge issue. That's going to be a really big issue. And so to to say just this, that, uh, you know, training camp is all physical or training or, or practice is all physical, well, that, that's, that's not really giving it the right, feel you know what i'm saying mm, right absolutely and, yeah and so then it, but then again and then if you say well competing is all mental well yeah mental is an important part of it um but uh you still have to be in shape you still have to have the right skills and if you don't it doesn't matter how strong your mind is you're gonna lose i mean it's like if i went to the cage to if i went to fight today well i haven't really been training very much i'm uh you know i consider myself retired and so i've been working out maybe three four times a week nothing too serious though and so my mind would be the same as it always was. And, you know, my body wouldn't be, though. And so my my mind would be ready to do body things that my body wouldn't be able to. So I, I don't think you can say 
90 10 and 10 90 i don't i i don't think that's fair at all and i frankly i would think the percentages would stay very very similar um you know where i think you could diverge is you know i think youth athletics for example or or low level competitions um i think that's somewhere where you can get away with being better physically than somebody um and winning a lot because you know the mind doesn't the if one kid's way better than another kid they're going to beat them regardless of, of mental flawed, flawed mental characteristics. But once kids get better and better and better or people get better and better and better, that's where you're really going to see the difference between one person's mind and another person's mind. Right. So on the, on the day of competition, what are some things that you do to help your kids focus and just focus on the task at hand? Um, yeah, everybody's different. Uh-huh. And, you know, like I said, for myself, it's be it's being super relaxed. That That's my thing. That's what I need. Um, and see, I guess as a coach, you have to understand every every athlete is diff- different. Some of them you got to get pumped up. Some of them you got to calm them down. You know, some of them worry a lot, so you got to spend some time making them not worry. Some of them get a little too excited, so you got to get them focused in on what they, you know, what specifically they need to do. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of different methods to it, but the most important thing is getting kids really, really focused on what they specifically what they need to do in the match to win or, you know, in the competition to win or at your job to do the best you can do. If you had to build a roadmap for parents in terms of helping them become the best parent they can be for their child in terms of sports and athletic development, starting from the time the child is born until graduating high school, what would that in an ideal setting look like to you? Um, I mean, it's at some point, and I think it's, you know, the most important thing a parent can do at, you know, I think they can have a really a lot of good influences when they're younger, but as they get, and it could be say somewhere between 11 and 14 years old, when the kid gets a little more mature, the best thing that the parent can do is find a really great coach who they trust and be hands off hmm. and just say, Hey, I trust you. I trust your coach and, and go get it. Right. I mean, and, cause you really see lots of times parents who continue to try to motivate past that point. Um, it has an adverse effect because the it, listen. If the kids are going to be good, they're going to want to do it themselves, or they're not. And it's really that simple. And so, what you need to do as a parent is find a find a coach or find a group of kids who motivates your child to be the best they can be, because you're not going to do it. And if you're driving them past, you know, like I said, eleven to fourteen, it's somewhere where a kid matures. If you're trying to drive them past that point, it's going to have adverse effect. They're they're gonna they're gonna. Uh, they're going to quit. They're going to hate you. One of those things is going to happen. So, you know, uh, so I guess that's kind of at an older age. At a younger age, I would just I would teach them to love the competition. I would teach them a good work ethic. I would teach them to uh, be good at failing, you know, to, to bounce back, to have that adversity. So I, I would teach them those simple things. Listen, it could be a, it could be as simple things like, you know, my daughter, oh, what the heck did she say this morning? She said, oh, someone's really good at something. Someone, oh, this person's really good at this. And I said, well, I bet they've had a lot of practice, right? And so I'm constantly instilling mm-hmm. that message that, well, listen, they didn't get good just because they got good because they practiced at something, right? Or because they worked or said, you know, she might say, oh, well, that person's really good at that. And I'll say, oh, well, they, they probably worked pretty hard at that. And so I'm, you know, constantly instilling that message from a young age that, well, they, there, there's a reason why people are good at things. It's not just because. They didn't, they just didn't come out of the womb and were great at something. That just didn't happen. And so that's kind of something I do with my own daughter at five years old. Um, yeah. Great, great. And, and in terms of, you know, something that comes up a lot is uh, specialization. <laughs> What's your take on that for kids? Yeah, I, I put up a few mental Mondays on this topic. So, uh, you know, this so this is what goes out saying, like, say, baseball, I know pitchers, if kids throw a lot from the younger ages, they develop some Tommy John's issues and that kind of stuff. Obviously, if a, if there's a sport or an activity that does that kind of thing, then it will be negative to do it uh, a lot at a younger age. But, you know, I don't really see the issue with specialization. And now I'm not saying at five. That's not what I'm saying. I, you know, again, I, I go back to that 11 through 14 eight year, year old age. I use that a lot for when a kid starts making their own decisions on, on what they want to do with their life. And so, you know, when they're when they're old enough to make that decision, if they're mature, it might be 11, it might be 12, it might be 13. OK, uh, I see no problem with specialization. And again, that's sans if it causes injury of some sort. But, you know, pe- people really see an issue with it in high school. And it just I think it's just people who don't like change and they want things to be the way they were when they were kids. Well, that's just not the case. And frankly, what, what we want kids to learn from sport 
is what it takes to be successful. It, all these characters are talking about hard work, dealing with adversity, persistence. So how do you learn that? Well, you pick something you want to do and you try really hard at it and you fail some and you get back up and you fail some more and you, and you, uh, you do some problem solving, right? And that, so that's how you really learn something. If your parents making you do something, you don't really learn it. If you don't really care about something, you don't really learn it. You, you, the, the way you learn the most is when you're deeply passionate about something. And there's nothing that matters more than you being successful at it, which that's the way I was for uh, many, many, many years about wrestling. And so why are we going to say if a kid at 12 years old says, this is what I want to do with my life? I can't possibly find a negative with that. I really can't. And so that's where I, you know, some of these people who say who are so against it. Now, am I against a parent forcing a kid to do something year round? Yes, absolutely. And obviously. Okay, but if a kid at 12 says, what I want to do is be a great wrestler as a coach, I'm going to say, well, this is what it's going to take to get where you want to get to. And then they're going to go. And so I just can't I can't really see the issue with some of uh, some of their problems. So for you, what what was your uh, what was your sports background when you were a kid? Did you play a lot of different sports? When did you specialize? Well, uh, so I did. I did. I played all sports. Um, And so this is again. So at fifth grade, I said, I want I, I remember I watched the state tournament in fifth grade. And so in fifth grade, I said, I want to be a good wrestler. And in order to be a good wrestler, I need to wrestle more in the spring, so I want to quit baseball. I told my parents that in fifth grade. Wow. And so that, that was at 11 years old. And so that's why I said, I, that's kind of like, I think I was on, on the young end, the young end of making those mature decisions for myself. And so I quit baseball in fifth grade because I wanted to spend three to four more months wrestling because I wanted to be better at it. And obviously, I started seeing the, the fruits of my labors, and I started getting better at wrestling. And then uh, when I was 15, that was, so I was 14, but when I was 15, I watched the Olympic trials. When I was 14, that was my last year playing football. And then after that, I said, all, all I want to do is wrestle all, the, all year round because I want to be the best wrestler in America. And that's all I did. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> so also with parents, you know, I think they get a lot of pressure for their kids to compete a lot. So, I mean, what, what would your be your advice there with kids uh, growing up and competing? Are they competing too much when they're young? Like, what would that ideally look like? What would you recommend for parents there in terms of yeah. competition? Um, so, yeah, I, we're, we're, I don't want to say anti-competition, but yes, people are competing too young, uh, significantly too young, significantly too much. I mean, anything that has a, a national championship before age 10 is pure idiocy. Why, why kids need to be competing at that level at that age is, is just so dumb. And, uh, I, you know, I, I rage against a lot in wrestling because there are those things in wrestling that people do. It doesn't matter if they're the best in the country when they're seven. Who freaking cares? Because they didn't make those decisions on their own. And if you're telling me they did, you're lying to me. Because I have a five-year-old. She doesn't make barely any decisions on her own. You know, we're telling her, hey, let's go to gymnastics tonight. She says, okay. And so it's like, well, why are you driving these kids to be successful at a young age? It's going to have an adverse effect over the long term. So there's not really any benefit to it. Um, you, you're more, you're more treating it as a reflection of yourself, um, and trying to feel good because your kid's having success at that age. And so, yeah, we, we go against competing, um, a lot at a younger age. I, I really don't see a long-term benefit to it. Uh, I don't think my daughter will compete in, in anything. I, I mean, who knows? Maybe if there's a youth soccer or something, maybe she'll play a couple of games, but you know, in wrestling, I don't see the benefit of her competing say before seven years old and then you know at eight nine ten it'll probably be you know minimal competition and then if if it's something she wants to do seriously and if it's another sport it's similar you know a similar thought process if it's something she wants to do more seriously then at you know at 11 12 13 14 we'll we'll support her and we'll find her the right coaching and uh we'll we'll let her do her thing so ben i know you're big on reading are there any books that have really helped you and influenced you that you would recommend on the topic of mindset um yeah there's hundreds <laughs> uh you know the the funny thing so i you know i said i i didn't think about the mind uh or the mental stuff really till college is that i my own the only thing the literally the only thing i liked reading through middle school and high school was about successful athletes biographies it's all it's a little all i read and so you know, w- without doing it purposefully, without thinking about what I was doing, I think I was reading about the greatest minds in sport. Because obviously, when you read a biography about someone, you get a, you get some insight into how they think and how they do what they do. And so, by the time I was eighteen, I'd probably read 
I don't know, 200 biographies of high, high level athletes. So I'm getting, you know, constant insight into what these people are thinking. And again, that wasn't me thinking I should study all of these people. That was me just saying, I love reading about people who succeed in athletics. I enjoy it. And so I'm going to keep reading them. And I think, you know, in turn, that gave me a lot of insight into how they think. Is there one that you gift the most to people? Um, is there a book? Well, I mean, the, the guy I read the most about was Muhammad Ali. I think he, he was just, he was fascinating in general, but obviously highest of high level athletes and very just intriguing gentlemen. Um, you know, the, the, there's two that I give to parents that I think are really good. Uh, and they're pretty, they're pretty easy reads. One would be, uh, mindset by Carol Dweck. I think that's a really simple read. It's a simple concept to understand for parents and it makes the world of difference for kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other one, and again, you know, I've, I've heard books and hundreds and hundreds of books, but if I got to pick a couple, the other one would be, um, oh my gosh. Oh, the art of learning by Josh Waitzkin. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Yep. It, it, again, just a simple book. And that, that's one right there where, and he's very introspective in the book. Um, where he talks about the pressures of competing as a kid and, you know, his parents, did, you know, his, and he says that his parents did a great job not putting too much pressure on him because he was already putting the pressure on himself. And so, um, you know, th- those are two that I think are really good. They're, they're pretty easy reads. Um, and they make a big, a big difference. Fantastic. And Ben, just as a final wrap up question, do you have any last words of wisdom on mindset or anything you want to leave our audience with? Man, you know, I, I think we covered quite a bit. I guess, you know, the, the one area that it, it was, it, you didn't really, we didn't get to talk about, it could be my fault, could be yours. <laughs> we'll, <laughs> never, we'll never know. Um, you know, it would be keeping a beginner's mindset. Mm. Um, and so that's, you know, understanding that you have so much to learn. And again, they've done studies on this. The people who, people who have a low level understanding of stuff think they know more than they actually know. And people who have a high level of understanding think they know less than they know. And so, um, you know, people who are experts in their field, they realize that there's so much more for them to learn. There's a world of knowledge that they're never going to, uh, never going to be able to fully take in. And so, uh, you know, that's for me, just keep learning, keep, keep digging, keep trying to figure the world out, uh, you know, out of the endeavor that you're in, keep trying to figure it all out. That, that's gigantic. I love it. And then Ben, if people want to learn more about you, where can they find you? Uh, I, you know, I, I, kind of, I communicate mostly through Twitter. I don't do a lot of Facebook or Instagram. Um, so it's just at Ben Askren on Twitter. Perfect. Ben, great stuff. There's so much you mentioned here that people can take and apply to their lives. I wish more people got to see this side of you because I know all the great things that you're doing for the kids and your community. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks so much for coming on. All right. Thanks, Bill. There it is. I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. There were a lot of key takeaways, a lot of gold nuggets. If you just listen closely to what he was saying, hopefully I was able to bring that out for you all. Uh, If you want the show notes and links to everything we discussed, just head over to anchorsofhealth.com slash 21. That's it for me, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Peace.